What's up, guys? Rachel Lindsay here, and I am teaming up with your favorite Ringer podcasters to deliver the Bravo drama and news that you've been craving on Morally Corrupt. It's the show about all things Bravo, from the housewives to summer house and everything in between. We'll be mentioning it all every week. Check it out on Spotify and TheRinger.com. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by Read, Write, Own, Building the Next Era of the Internet, a new book from entrepreneur and startup investor Chris Dixon. If you're listening to this podcast, you know what it's like to be part of a community of fans. You value the people who play, perform, and create for everyone. But what if there are more ways to support them, more ways to be a fan? And what if you had even more ways to connect with the teams, artists, and other creators that you love? Even though creators make the internet valuable, how much value do they get for their work? Well, that's mostly up to a few big tech companies. Shouldn't creators get more from the platforms they make successful? More value, but also, more say, more control, more ownership. Read, Write, Own explores an alternative future for the internet, one that reclaims control for creators, fans, listeners, and gamers, the people who not only use the internet, but make it useful. Read, Write, Own imagines an internet built by us for us. So order your copy of the book today or learn more at readwriteown.com. I need support to have to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me on the other line from his podcast perch in a sewer in Albuquerque, it's Andy Greenwald. I know you're referencing tonight's episode of Better Call Saul and I want to be clear, I did not arrive in Albuquerque via that sewer line, but I did leave that way. (laughs) Andy, it's great to see your face. It's uh, Monday afternoon when we're recording. This is going to be going up after the mid-season finale of Better Call Saul, and we will be breaking down that episode. We're also going to talk a bit about Barry, which we haven't done in a couple of weeks, but which I was absolutely, perhaps disturbingly delighted by this week. And uh, we thought we'd just start the beginning of the pod with a little bit of chat about our guy Tom Cruise. who's about to fly back into our lives with Top Gun Maverick. How do you feel about a CRAG uh, movie theater experience for that one. Should we I do would, that? Oh my God. First of all, I'm a little moved. <laughs> you caught me. I, I would love that. I would love to be your radar guy. I will sit behind you. Like Kai, was, would you come to the east side for that? Or like, what if we met somewhat centrally? This is to see the movie? Yeah, sure. I think that would be fun. A little watch outing. Could we pod immediately Let's afterwards, like from the lobby? Popcorn sure, but still we, could also, we could also like go get like a tequila and a beer. Oh. By the way, <laughs> I'm really ready for this post-pandemic CR hangs, where usually you're like a burger and a beer, but you were like first a liquor, then a beer. Food, DVD. Yeah, yeah I'm trying to squeeze as much out as I can. Uh, look, I let's talk idea. a little bit about Tom Cruise, because obviously Top Gun, we talked about Andy's maiden voyage uh, with Pete Mitchell a couple weeks ago. He got to he watch Top Gun for the first time. That was a very amusing anecdote. I love that. Um, but today, I guess it came out yesterday. We got a trailer for Mission Impossible Seven: Colon Dead Reckoning, comma Part One. I believe. Mm-hmm. I don't even know if all that punctuation is in there, but I, that's how I think of it. Hollywood's grammarian, Chris <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> and we were chatting a little bit about this, Andy, before we recorded, and I was like, "Holy shit!" You know, just a chill year to wait for this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you were like, "Well, would you tell me what you thought?" Okay, so. This trailer dropped. Let's set the stage for this. I'm so excited for this movie. I, like most people, correctly believe that 
these are the most consistently entertaining big budget franchise films that Hollywood makes. Uh, I believe that Tom Cruise has made a bet with the world that he will just keep making these until he dies in an exploding helicopter and train accident. It's a bet we've accepted. We hope it doesn't happen, but keep making them and we'll see. The last two have been absolutely great. So we're also... The last two being Fallout. Mm-hmm. And then Ghost Pro was before... Rogue Nash was before Rogue Nash. Yeah. Rogue right. Nash, Fallout, this one. Yeah. And the next one. Um, all Macquarie. Dead Rex, Macquarie took over the P1 and P2. Yeah. Well said. We are also seeing this first footage coming off of a really, really wonderful, classic Hollywood Reporter story where they're basically like, they've been shooting these movies on and off for three years. Mm -hmm. They were supposed to come out last year. Now they will probably come out next year and the year after. Again, TBD. (laughs) They are like renting cruise ships to quarantine from COVID. They are also seemingly, you know, one thing I learned from Top Gun, which as you said, I watched recently, is that you can get like missile lock. And if you get missile lock, then you can stop playing the video game. Yeah, and, and the well, other Top Gun, they call it, I got good tone. Right. So <laughs> Macquarie and Cruise Incorporated got good tone missile lock on COVID hotspots, where they were like, bet, we're going to film these sequels. And you know what's lovely in early 2020? <laughs> Northern Italy. <laughs> Northern Italy, guys. Look out. So it's been a ride for movies that will themselves be rides. And then this trailer drops, and it just looks fantastic. It's everything you want. It's stunning vistas. It's the return of, I don't know if they're franchise favorites, but I'm glad Canadian character acting legend Henry Cherney gets to eat again after yeah. being on ice for the last 26 years of this franchise. Kittredge. They're bringing Kittredge back. It's fun. It's so much fun. Dazzling faces, incredible production designs, wild locations that one thought did occur to me. And I want to be clear when I say this. The answer doesn't matter. Okay? It doesn't matter. But my question for you, Chris, is, Sincerely, what are these movies about? And when you say this, you don't mean like, what is this about? Is this about the true purpose of espionage in a modern world? Right. It's yeah. not about what is an individual in relationship to the nation state or the rogue nation state, for that matter. You're literally like, what happens in these movies, right? Yeah, because I have no idea. And I do think that that is not a bug, it's a feature, right? Like, that is kind of the point. I guess it was sort of thrown into relief when not only did a lot of faces start coming back, but you sort of remember that Rebecca Ferguson and Vanessa Kirby are in the series in what I thought was the same role, but and isn't. It, forgive me if I'm wrong, but isn't isn't Michelle Monaghan and Haley Atwell both also in these films? Well, Michelle Monaghan was his wife, and then and, she, she showed up. kind of back in this one, right? She was back at the end of the last one. Yes. But Haley Atwell's in this one. And by the way, all time, all time, all time, Quote here. Let me let me see if I can call this up. This is from Haley Atwell, right? This is Haley Atwell's quote. This is on the Wikipedia page, so you know it's not a lie. Her character's name is Grace. Christopher mm. McQuarrie is on record as saying this character is, quote, a destructive force of nature. Okay. Atwell explained her character is, quote, somewhat ambiguous and said, and again, I quote, I've been living in an existential crisis since October going, who am I? Who am I? An actor in search of a character. There's ambiguity. The interesting thing we're exploring is her resistance to a situation she finds herself in, which is to say she is a character in a filmed entertainment. (laughs) How she starts off, where she becomes, the journey of what she comes into, what is asked of her, and potentially where she ends up, where she ends up. Okay, so first of all, thank you, Stanislavski. That's drama. (laughs) Two, that is the most lovely, the most polite, the most erudite way of saying I've been shooting this for two years of my adult life and I haven't seen a script yet. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's bonkers. So what I'm asking you is, I think we know the answer is that it doesn't matter. But B, like if you had to do a sketch of like what's happening in these movies up to this point, what would it even look like? And why would it be that drawing of a horse, you know, where it starts as a real thing and ends as... Sean and I have a running thing where we try to figure out what's been happening in the Jurassic Park movies. And we often right. like conflate one thing happening in another. And this goes back essentially to the sequels to the original, but like for sure is it happening during this Colin Trevorrow era of these movies. And I would stipulate that Jurassic Park is like, no, the plot is super important. You know, right. like we, it's really essential that we understand what's going on with like 
what they've done to Richard Attenborough's discovery and like th- how it's mutated and all like the different machinations of this corporation and all this other stuff. I honestly still don't know if I've seen all these movies, but it, that's my my impression. And the way that they're sort of pitching the end of this saga is kind of like everything comes to a head. Right. And you're like, okay, like I, but dinosaurs are going to be in it, right? And they are. Mission Impossible is like, there is that if you want to try and follow along with the renegade CIA intelligence community that's happening, but then also seems to have other disavowed agents in the rogue nation trying to go up against them. And there's a lot of stuff about who's a double agent, who's a mole. Right. There's the Alec Baldwin, Angela Bassett transfer of power, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sean Harris is like the big bad in oh, one and a half yeah. movies, right? Right. And then Cavill sort of takes over in Fallout, but Sean Harris is still a player in Fallout. And, and now it's Isai Morales. Isai Morales is in the mix, yeah. Shea Wiggum in the mix in this one, too. I think Great Shea cast. Wiggum is going to be more of a suit. Is Angela Bassett in this movie? S- thus far, no. But I think many people who will ultimately be in this film have not yet been contacted about being in the film. <laughs> Rob Delaney is in the film. My guy Charles Parnell, Charlie P from Briar Patch, who Tom loves because he was in Top Gun and now is in both of these movies. Thrilled for him. I'm going to be saying this a lot because he's a wonderful actor and guy. Yeah, I mean, I just, I think the thing is, future generations, should they exist, will look back on this era, I think, with some raised eyebrows and incredulity. I mean, full stop, that's the end of the sentence. But specifically about these entertainments and the kind of, you know, the franchisification, the sanctimonious trilogizing, trilogizing, I'm making up this movie, you make something, trilogizing, making something Mm -hmm. a trilogy. The Marvel movie thing, right? Where it's like, they did it to Bond. Where like, Bond is a secret agent who drinks liquor and bones chicks and then sometimes shoots Russians, right? Like, that's James Bond. But that's the, why he's popular. the sky but falling of it, right? Spectre and, oh, the lost thing, like making it, yeah, exactly. And similarly to this, I think this movie is going to be amazing because the thing that Macquarie and Cruz realize is that it's just hot, loud nonsense and we love it for it because it's so considered and no expenses spared and they do they do it better than anyone else but this trailer where it's just like whose side are you on ethan like you know ethan is on the side of capitalism and making money for paramount and he's the best there is at what he does that's cool I thought for a second you were being serious and you were like my thing is ethan hunt is on the, the side of free markets and he's just <laughs> oh, for sure for sure he is oh my god um it's 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 incredible i just it looks amazing it's not done, but I couldn't do it. I could tell you about the knock list in number one, but at this point, I don't know what we're... Wasn't Wolf Blitzer in the last one? Like, I don't even uh, know what's going Wolf on. Wolf Blitzer's in the Russian one. In, in the, the one where the Kremlin explodes, right. they do the whole thing where Wolf Blitzer is on CNN and is like, this, like, they've brought down this agency and the guy is like, oh no, and then it's actually like, psych, I'm Ethan Hunt. Remember? Oh, yeah. In the beginning. Yeah. I, I look. He's in the hospital bed. I think the other thing is, and this is a, a larger conversation to have that we're not going to have today, but like if you had to be you, which is to say a red shirt in a fictional universe, I think the one to live in would be the Mission Impossible universe. Now, not if you. Uh, and a lot, not of, if you're a, a lot of landmarks explode. And I yeah, love, but I love thing, doing I, touristy stuff. Do you? That was what I was going to say. Like, if you are in the Marvel Universe, odds are you're going to get turned into a Hulk or maybe you're vacationing in Sokovia. That's something you would do. And the next thing you know, right? But Can I ask you a question if we're really talking about this? When you went away to make Briar Patch, we continued this podcast. You called in from parking lots across America. (laughs) I did. And You're welcome. I think we we did do some recaps of shows, but we also had a, a, a variety of excellent guest hosts. But what would happen, and I think that this should be a binding agreement that we make here. Kaya can be our notary. All right. What if there's a blip? Yeah. If I go, I think I want you to keep doing the watch. Whoa. Yeah. But whoever replaces me has to understand that if I am brought back by Doctor Strange and Iron Man. Right. I'm going to want my chair back. I love this because first of all, it's a poison pill. You know as well as I do that if you get blipped out, this podcast ends by late June. 
<laughs> I do two what more if interviews. You're fully recommitted to TV. <laughs> you're just like, man. Time to watch more shows. Yeah. No, I would do two interviews with like forgotten 80s British twee pop front people. Right. Like Lawrence from Felt would finally do the 90 minute sit down with me. And then. And then yeah, Bill would email you be like, why don't we do this monthly? <laughs> Bill pays attention to the watch? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's nice. Uh, no, I, I, yeah, sure. I commit to this. I commit to this. If the reverse happens, I want you to keep going. Yeah, and you want to know why? It, is because I think I would do very well during a blip. I think there would be a lot of content coming out of that. How wait, does the, like how does the blip ex, you know affect streaming? Well, yes, but I also I'm thinking about like Judd Apatow would make a movie about people making a movie, and then half the cast gets blipped. And like Netflix gives him thirty million dollars, and nine people watch it. Like there would be a lot of that sort of thing. But what if what if like Ted and Reed get blipped, and somebody finally looks at the Netflix books, and they're like, "Wait a second, <laughs> you guys." <laughs> <laughs> Wait, we don't have to Chris, put all the shows up at once. <laughs> do you think like some entire services would get blipped? That would be pretty cool, though, right? Like, if there was a blip and there wasn't like a Peacock Like, what if you anymore? were the last pizza chain? You know? Okay. Right. But what if then you were, like, Little Caesars? <laughs> I mean... I mean, no free ads. That's kind of a dig, I guess. Um, no, I think... Yeah, I, look, I'm going to stand by it. I think Mission Impossible is the best franchise to live in because Ethan Hunt is just going to keep sprinting until the world is saved, right? I don't take a lot of selfies in front of major city monuments. And the other ones are just, the other ones are too dangerous. They're just, they're, they're, they're it's just too dangerous all the time. Like the DC universe, they destroy entire cities constantly, right? Um, as you said, MCU could get blipped out of existence. You could, Iron Man suit could fall on you. The Eternals could happen again. I don't want that. Um, I just, th I think you're right. I think that there is an element to what Mission Impossible does. Jurassic has dinosaurs. They could come and eat us. <laughs> I just think that what Mission does is it doesn't try to... It only reinvents the wheel in so much as it's like, what if Ethan Hunt drove a car where the wheels fell off, you know, and he yeah. went over a mountain on that car. It's not trying to reinvent the wheel. Like, what has to happen is Ethan Hunt has to truly find the love of his life or reconcile with his father or die or anything that we tend to, like, kind of graft onto these franchise movies where we're, like, the only real... Uh, sign of movement and vitality is in fact massive U-turns in the plot. That's also why the last Bond movie was so cynical to me because, and we don't, I don't need to say anything. I think people know, but like it ends with something pretty definitive, right? Yes. Like, Drastic. but it's completely cynical because we know the character's coming back and it felt tacked on to add emotion to a movie that, made no sense, made right. no linear sense and didn't seem worth the effort, you know? This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. New Year's resolutions are fun the first couple of weeks. Then you kind of maybe conveniently forget about them halfway through January. No shame, it happens to us all. But this year I have a foolproof plan, at least when it comes to saving money. Just switch to Mint Mobile and you're done. Goal accomplished. Because for a limited time, their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three-month plan. The great thing about Mint Mobile is there's no jaw-dropping monthly bills or unexpected overages, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text. Get this new customer offer today at mintmobile.com slash watch. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. You might say all kinds of stuff when things go wrong, but these are the words you really need to remember. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. They've got options to fit your unique insurance needs, meaning you can talk to your agent to choose the coverage you need, have coverage options to protect the things you value most, file a claim right on the State Farm mobile app, and even reach a real person when you need to talk to someone. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. I've got kids, and that means it's always about them. But I need support, too. That's where Ollie comes in, with their delightful, hard-working gummies. My partner and I can actually get a good night's sleep, so we'll both stand a chance of managing our stress responses. Even when the kids are doing parkour in the living room, discover Ollie vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. 
Tax Act knows you don't look forward to taxes. Tax Act doesn't even look forward to taxes. And Tax Act is a tax software company. It's basically Tax Act's whole thing. If Tax Act did things over, maybe Tax Act would end up teaching kindergarten or leading fly fishing tours. But that's a different story for a different ad. So why don't we just agree that taxes aren't fun, but you still have to do them? Tax Act's filing software can help you do that. Tax Act. Let's get them over with. Speaking of needing to make things happen to feel yeah, significant. Okay. All right, Here we so go. Let's talk about the the mid-season finale of Better Call Saul. It's called Plan and Execution. It was written and directed by Thomas Schnauz. And I don't really know what to do with mid-season finales anymore. This is becoming, I guess not, I wouldn't say increasingly common, but at least for two shows that I love quite a bit, Saul and Ozark, they just did them. Stranger Things is going to do this in a couple of weeks where they have seven episodes and then two movie-length episodes coming in July. Uh, Stranger Things is actually coming this week. Maybe we'll chat about that later. Um, you know, Breaking Bad has done this. this. This is a thing. I don't always know whether or not it is creatively satisfying or at least satisfying as a sort of consumer of television because there seems to be, to quote Breaking Bad, a little bit of a half measure going on here mm-hmm. where I think you want the sensation of something momentous and cliffhangery to happen. But then they also, it's not the full season. It's not see in a year. It's see you in six weeks. It's see you in whatever the interval is. And I do think that there is a little bit, it's like stuck between stations with these mid-season formats. That can be a conversation that we have a little bit later on. Obviously, now that we're talking about this episode, spoilers ahead. So if you haven't watched the episode, please stop. In this episode, we essentially get to the end of, uh, well, we get to the end of Howard Hamlin, quite literally. I think you could say that in some ways, Saul and Kim troll Howard Hamlin to death. Maybe that wasn't their intention. Obviously, it wasn't. But he winds up in their apartment, dressing them down, saying, even though I've been ruined, I know what you did, and I'm going to spend the rest of my life proving it, telling everybody who will listen about what you've done to me and who you are. Lalo Salamanca walks in, somewhat conveniently, at that moment. I would say so. uh, I guess, let me ask you, let's start here. Why does Lalo kill Howard? Because he's talking too much? Because he's signaling his intention to kill everyone in the room who has seen him alive? Um, that after they're done, after he's done talking to Kim and Saul, they will meet a similar fate? Uh, I think all of that is likely, reasonable, and in play. I think the other potential answer speaks to your introduction to this segment, which is because this was the midseason finale. And it needed a bang. Is that cynical to think that? Yeah. I mean, I have some cynical responses to this episode. I'm not proud of them. I don't think they're necessarily representative of my larger feelings for the show or my deep affection for it and respect for it. But but yeah, I do have some cynical reactions to this. And I, and I wonder if it does go back to your point about the idea of a mid-season break, at least as it's currently understood. Because, you know... Breaking Bad also divided its fifth and final season into two halves. However, I believe that was more along the lines of what The Sopranos did, which is to say sort of getting cute with contractual accounting because Breaking Bad's final season was eight episodes across two full calendar years. Yes. So it was essentially two seasons. Um, that said, the first half of its final season ended with Walt figuring out who Heisenberg is. Right. Which was a pretty boffo uh, Hank, and dramatic Hank, way. Hank, I'm sorry. Figuring, yeah. Hank figuring out who Heisenberg is. Yes. Yeah. That was a little bit different. So let's talk Howard. Okay. Yeah. Or so do you I want to talk Lalo or Howard? Let's start. Let's do Howard and then we can go into Lalo because the two are obviously from now on, they're going to be linked, even though for the entirety of the show, they were not. You know, this, these are two characters who were existing yep. in the two halves of Better Call Saul as a show. Mm-hmm. There was the cartel half, there's the legal half. Kim and Saul slash Jimmy are kind of smack in the middle, maybe unbeknownst to Kim how deeply into the cartel world they are, but they are there. And right, so not only is it the two halves of the show, in a lot of ways, it is the Sandpiper plotline that has, you know, weirdly driven a lot of this series. I think 
for as much as you and I maybe like joked around about doc review and class action lawsuits, like this definitely had staying power. So we're here again. And after the, um, the Sandpiper mediation uh, meeting where Rich Schweikert and Cliff Main and Howard are all there with this mediator and Howard has a complete meltdown, somewhat drug induced, but also just finally like Jim and Kimmy's or uh, Saul and, and Kim's D-Day plan comes to fruition yep. at, at, after some last second reshoots, very funny reshoots in the park. Howard crumbles, the class action suit falls apart. They're going to be forced to take the original offer. And he comes to their apartment to sort of read them the riot act, or at least tell them that no matter what, he knows what they did. I have to say, I thought Patrick Fabian was incredible in this episode. I thought that last scene, it was not apparent to me until the very last second that that was going to be his last scene. Mm -hmm. And I thought that the way in which the show for the first time, maybe almost made that moment where it was like Howard is the protagonist and this is being done to him by these two more or less evil people. Yes. That was like the the most revelatory part of it rather than Lalo killing him. I agree. And I do want to spend some time shouting at Patrick Fabian, who we've talked about this throughout this mini season, half season. The joy of a long running show is watching actors continue to dig into a character, find new levels, find new layers, find new things to show us that they discover in their artistic journey. And particularly this universe, the Albuquerque, Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul universe, has been so generous to actors who have not had these opportunities before. I mean, start at the top, Cranston, Odenkirk, for sure. You know, this was not what they were known for. And Jonathan now it is Banks. what they will yeah. always be known for. Yeah. Jonathan Banks, Giancarlo Esposito, Ray Seahorn, Patrick Fabian on that list now too. And he was so strong in the end of this episode. And the moral scales switched so abruptly and dramatically, which I do believe was the intention, right? That it almost had the reverse effect on me where I felt slightly cheated about the lack of time we had to spend with this truth-telling Howard, mm -hmm. with this vulnerable Howard, with this, my marriage has fallen apart. Oh, by I'm, the way, you didn't know I was married until three weeks ago. Right. I'm Howard. in debt. Yeah. I'm living in the guest house. Yeah. I, the show has had an interesting relationship with storytelling real estate. And I think it's the bill is coming due in a potentially disappointing way thus far in this season. And we'll get to that in a minute. But it has luxuriated in so much detail. You know, that is the show's brand. That's what it does. But, and it does it differently and better than any other show. It's not just that Lalo is back in town and observing the super lab. It's that he's living in a sewer and showering at a rest stop and sleeping for one hour increments in a Subaru Outback, right? Like we know all of those details mm -hmm. to an almost obsessive degree. But we were denied any other aspects of Howard's humanity because there was just simply too much real estate with the two shows that exist in the show. Not too much real estate, but too much ground to cover. Between the two shows that exist in the show, between Jimmy and Chuck, between all of it. And so the attempt to crash it in now at the end, I don't know. I was weirdly aligned with Howard, not just in the, oh my God, you people are evil. Well, he's You're certainly empty. very cruel it, to Kim. You have a piece missing. Like he's like, I understand but, what's going on right. with Jimmy, but you have a piece missing. It, the, the, the problem with that scene for me was that I was completely aligned with Howard in that I, I didn't understand why they did it either. I didn't understand because we spent, I mean, the first 20 minutes of the episode is extremely entertaining with our film crew gang and also John Ennis, Bob Odenkirk's old buddy from Mr. Show, getting to reunite with him to play the mediator in, in photos anyway, but also he's stacking carts at the local stop and save or whatever. That was all great. But it was so much effort for such an ultimately not that interesting or inspiring plan, even though it worked, right? It worked. But simply like, why, other than spite? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I, I am, it left me a little cold. As you so, can tell, by the way, I'm trying to puzzle through this. Well, I think one of the reasons why Howard, the Howard thing was so 
maybe wasn't working for you, if I can mm-hmm. psychoanalyze you, is that like, Please. let's let's say like for this show, even though it is not an action-packed show, no. I do think that the adage of action makes character or action is character is really appropriate for, for Better Call Saul because we get to see so much process. We get to see people work process, in such yeah. a detailed way. Mm-hmm. And... I, we get some of it in the earlier seasons, but we haven't really gotten that with Howard. Howard has his sort of character traits, like his suits, his hair, and his demeanor, and his manner, but we don't really get to see Howard like do stuff that gives us an idea of who he is. So I think that that scene at the end, when he's like, here's where I'm at, you know, we had gotten a little hint of that from the him making coffee for his wife yeah. moment. But maybe I don't feel like I knew Howard that well. And so I was at once like not necessarily, I wasn't heartbroken about him dying. And I thought that that was a really good, we've always talked about like, you know, you, you've bring this up a lot. David Chase being horrified about people's love of Mm -hmm. Tony. I even feel this way a little bit like uh, right now, a lot of mixed feelings about how much I am enjoying John Bernthal's performance on We Own the City versus what his character is doing. And like, I can feel myself like, quoting Wayne Jenkins like for fun and just being like that's maybe not like I shouldn't maybe do that and it's like because that's what anti-heroes or these villains that become so charismatic do they kind of seduce you right and uh, I was definitely seduced by this D-Day plan that Jimmy and Kim were doing but at the end I thought they did a really good job of having a guy who maybe isn't the best person and definitely fucked Kim over and definitely had you know, was basically like, it seems like Chuck hates his brother, so let's take care of this. At the end, you're just kind of like, you destroyed this guy. Like, you ruined him. Yeah, you're you're bad people. And your own moral fucking malfeasance of your involvement with the Salamanca cartel has led to his death. And so as he's kind of dressing them down, and they're trying to sort of not entirely deny that, that they're involved, but basically be like, nothing's going to happen here tonight. Like, you need to get out of here. I did feel myself just sort of being like, what have I been watching for five years? You know, like what I, and I like, I like having to ask myself that I do not want an easy watch. I don't want characters who are like on the right side of, of morality all the time. And I can just cheer for them. It's not about that. I think probably the, the issue here is a little bit of a reverse, honestly, of what happened with Skylar on breaking bad, where it was like Skylar, such a drag. Mm -hmm. I almost feel like Kim has been sainted. You know, and it's like, everybody's like, what's going to happen to Kim? I care more about Kim than my family members. Kim, Kim, Kim. And it's like, Kim can be fucked up too. Kim had an opportunity to go join a Clifford Maine promoted like social justice law firm or whatever she was going to Santa Fe to do. She she, she was going to get a kind of a grant. And she was like, it's more important me to fuck Howard over and drive back and like make sure that this photo shoot happens perfectly. And that's where she's arrived. Now, did... Did Saul corrupt her? Sure. You know, like, is there a piece missing? I love thinking about it. But maybe, maybe I'm just sort of throwing these ideas out here because I think there is something in the water where you're just like, oh, I had this idea of who Kim was and what Kim's path was here. And I think that this is deviating a little bit from it. And I think that's really interesting, but it's not always like the most crowd pleasing, even though I don't think Kim's going to have a crowd pleasing end. Sidebar appropriate legal term. I just don't want to forget to say, shout out the great Gene Efron, who plays Irene, lead lead uh, uh, class member in the class action for Sandpiper. She was on Briar Patch. She's a <laughs> lovely, lovely lady. And I was happy to see she her. She's an Albuquerque so local time. or what? Yes, she sure is. She's, okay. she's really cool. She's really kind and awesome. It was great to see her. So the Kim. Joanna thing. pointed out to me the other day that Saracen's grandmother is also was in the class, I think. She was in like at the Sandpiper home. Oh yeah, she has a line. I I completely. I was like, why do I know this person? That is that is not a show. I have. I'd like to rewatch that show. Friday Night Lights. Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't that be a nice way to spend some some time (laughs) later in life? Why is everything so long, like out of touch for you? I don't have time to watch (laughs) things, let alone rewatch things. But like that seems like a pleasant way to spend some time. Um, right, Kim. Here's my take right now, and I want to be very clear. I, this is not, I'm not doing a heel turn. I'm not zagging. This isn't a take. I'm not anti this show. My strong feeling after this episode, with how many left, six left to totally change my mind, and I can't wait for them to do so. My feeling is they ran out of story. 
My feeling is they simply did not have enough story to fill the multi-part final season vessel that everyone agreed upon. Um, Does that, is that like even in the remote, like, is that even remotely possible? Well, I mean, it's absolutely, it's fundamentally not true because they filmed, they wrote and filmed multiple more episodes. So they found stuff to do. But like we were saying before, there aren't enough characters. There aren't enough either new characters or surviving characters, but also there aren't enough stakes. Lalo versus Gus and Mike in the Super Lab could be an action set piece for the ages. But Lalo's not going to survive it. We know that, and everyone else is. So I'm not that interested in it. I'm not. I mean, I, I wish there was someone I was overlooking, but I don't think I am. So then let's go to the other side of the ledger. After tonight's episode, it's just Kim. So when you're saying everyone's obsessed with Kim, they better be, because she's she's the only thing that's left until they flip the switch and move us into the future, which they, you know, we still don't know when that's going to happen. And the reason I say that she's all that's left is because Jimmy is Saul. Jimmy is Saul. Mm -hmm. He became Saul really when Chuck died. And then I guess you could say that his solicitous love and affection for Kim is really the only thing that's keeping him. Does does he still, does she refer to him as Jimmy or Saul? Yes, Jimmy. Which, Jimmy, okay. She calls him Jimmy. That's why I think I always like confuse it when I'm about to say Jimmy or Saul and I'm like, what should I be calling him? Well, it's like Alfred or Paperboy. Right. He's Paperboy in the streets, but he's Alfred to people who actually know him. And that's, I think that's still where we're at with Saul until the last person who still calls him Jimmy goes off the board because Howard called him Jimmy too. That's right. I guess his experiences with Mike in the desert after the Lalo stuff, you know, that showed him one more piece. And then maybe the way he was treated at the courthouse after he, it was clear that he was in on something with the Salamancas or the cartel, that was sort of the last thing stripping away. But he's been Saul for a minute now. And the reason I say that is because the reaction of Jimmy and Kim to the death of Howard, but to, to his arrival, when they're kind of like a united front of assholes to him, and then to the Lalo arrival and his death, Kim's reaction is the one I'm most interested in. And I think, you know, we only get a few glimpse of Ray Seahorn's performance because they're saving a lot of it for the next half of the season or the next, you know, when the show picks up again, is absolutely hysterical, right? Mm-hmm. Because now there's a body count, there's stakes. It's all, it was, well, it also, started just as like a, a few guy just came t- back from the fucking debt. I mean, they were well, just- She knew though. Yeah, yes. But, and didn't tell him, which is still interesting. But if if you consider a relationship as a series of agreements, right? They entered into an agreement when they did that first con with the top shelf tequila mm-hmm. way back whenever. You just keep agreeing. You're still a partnership until someone says no, and they never said no. And all the next thing you know, your former boss and mentor's uh, blood is spattered all over your condo. Yeah. Right? And so that moment for her has weight and is interesting and, you know, is significant to me. But where else there is to go with this, you know, I I, I don't like that feeling. I don't like that I feel a little churlish about it, you know? I We spent so much time setting up the video camera for the guy in the cast and the dilated pupils and whoops, it was a fake private investigator. Okay, all for this moment. Okay, now, yeah, we're here. Now what? And still, the only thing on the table is Lala will die, we don't know how, and we don't know what's going to happen to Kim. And what's going to happen in the future. That's what we have left. So what do you think, what is a lot, like Lalo and the whole thing, he's in the sewer, he calls Eladio, calls Hector, and re- yeah. well, he leaves a video for Eladio, then he calls Hector and realizes this, that phone is tapped, that the yeah. nursing home phone is tapped. And he puts out a smoke signal about how he's going to plan A and is going to go after Gus that night. And then in reality, goes to Kim and Jimmy. Yeah, after Mike has pulled everyone off. Of right. every, you know, he, he theoretically was watching them, but he stopped watching. So what, I, I'm not asking you, I, I don't think I missed anything. I'm curious, what do you think Lalo wants from Kim and Jimmy? Like, do, does he think that they have some sort of information about what Werner, Werner Ziegler was doing? Does, does he think like having his lawyer is going to somehow entice Gus to do something. I mean, like I see this is the thing is that you start to get into the more predictive elements of it. And then you can just sort of like kind of 
cross out a couple of eventualities because of what happens in Breaking Bad, right? I think that's the danger here. Um, remember the way that things were left with Lalo and Jimmy and Kim in season five. It was episode nine. It was called Bad Choice Road. It was also a Thomas Schnell's written and directed special. Also, maybe the best scene of the entire series. Absolutely. A high watermark that it has not been able to recreate as of yet. The issue, remember, was that was that Jimmy went with them to get the money, right? And then Mike bailed him out. And there were extra bullet holes in the car. Remember, Lalo does the jump to examine what happened because that was that mm-hmm. was when we learned that Lalo was both incredibly dogged as an investigator and also potentially uh, Spider Man. Yeah, he comes back to quick ask tw- about quick twitch ability. They say in the NFL, quick twitch, yeah. twitch speed. great yeah. vertical. Yeah, he really dazzled at the combine. Uh, Mike warns Jimmy about this, about to get their story straight. Lalo shows up. Kim tells Lalo the car was probably destroyed by by passersby. Remember, she steps up mm-hmm. and says, "Like, how dare you come in here and do all these things?" And Lalo They're like, stares "We're your at lawyers, her. yeah, right." Yes, and he accepts it and walks away. Now he's back to find and out. And Mike what is really watching them from a sniper rifle yes. this whole time. Yeah. So I think this is once again the proof of. Gus's involvement, Gus's man, Mike. There's a, it's very intentional that Lalo is like, there you are, Michael. Like he remembers that Mike is Gus's guy. Mm-hmm. So he's coming to, re- to, to get the true story that he didn't get in the previous season. Okay. Look, I mean, I think I'm still feeling kind of what we said last week, which would be, this would be so pleasurable if we were just clicking next episode, skip credits, next episode. So just hanging out. The callbacks and the little nods and the celebrations of itself are really welcome in that sort of show. But week to week, and, I, and here's, a, here's a question. Are we the dinosaurs here? Shout out Sam Neill and Laura Dern. <laughs> Although I guess the internet told me that Sam Neill was a dinosaur when Jurassic Park came out and Laura Dern was not. And so now we're upset about that. Is that right? Did you follow uh, that? I mean, Laura Dern wasn't upset about it, but yeah. She seems fine. Yeah. Are we the dinosaurs to be reviewing this show, which has aired week to week on AMC, as if it's going to be viewed week to week for the next 50 years of its existence on Netflix? Maybe. I think th- I think the way, I, I don't think it's a viewing habit or a viewer behavior thing. I think your point that you were sort of starting to make that I maybe derailed mm-hmm. us from about, maybe it sounds like overly critical to say they didn't have enough story for this, but it, you know, without getting too deep into what happened in Ozark for the last 13 episodes of Ozark, I think one of the things that I noticed about midway through the first half of the last season was that I was seeing a lot of the same scenes essentially played out over and over again. Mm. That there was not anything new or revelatory being kind of presented about characters, that they weren't changing, that their decisions didn't have a cause and effect relationship to one another. I think Saul is a superior show than Ozark, and I think generally speaking... That is still happening with Saul, although I would argue that some of those characters are more solidly now the people that they will be in Breaking Bad than they are emerging and evolving, you know, organisms. But I think that there is something about, we want to keep doing this, we're doing this for this last season, this is what we're kind of building towards, but the stuff that happens in between the beginning and the end is not as strong as the stuff that happens when the show is in full flight and when the show can still be anything and these characters can still do anything and they can still kind of have these digressive side adventures. And I mean, in some ways, I would say that this entire Howard thing was a digressive side adventure, but I think it's going to be the one that dooms these people, which is kind of an interesting conversation to have because it's like, is this thing that is not entirely entertaining or maybe not quite decipherable still incredibly important about what happens to these people and why why they sort of fall the way they do. Is this weird bloodlust that they have that then actually turns into blood? Yeah, and I wonder, and I'm still genuinely excited for and curious about the coda. The, what Howard said is fundamentally true in what this show has spent six seasons uh, articulating. There is something missing in these people. There's something broken. There's a piece missing. Perhaps a tequila stopper shaped piece. Yeah. Is that piece retrievable at their age and after everything they've been through? Is it possible? Is it allowable morally? What what does that mean? What would it even look like? And again, is Kim alive? 
it, can there be peace made between them or some happiness found? Can he get forgiveness from whomever is still alive at the end of the show? I mean, I'm inclined to believe that Kim is alive simply because no one else is in right. Gene in Nebraska, in Omaha's life timeline, right? Right. Who is? Like Jesse, I guess, if the final season goes to Alaska. Right. I mean, we know, I mean, I probably have not felt more confident that Kim makes it through this. But I'm getting a little bit frustrated by the amount that that's like, that by the fact that that's the grand total of my thoughts about the show. Yeah. Is whether or not Kim um, lives. Can I do, because this is a podcast, and we rarely do this. Look, we're known for being a podcast that 100% definitely comes out twice a week. That is the thing you can say about this podcast, right? That's what they're all saying. The industry <laughs> trades. When we have our banking guys like do evaluations, they're like, sure. that's definitely a podcast that exists. And it comes out. You know what I mean? Reliable. What we don't do is we don't traffic really in like hot take stuff. You know, we're not, we're not chasing aggregation. Uh huh. That said, I'm going to throw something out there. I think the argument that this show is better than Breaking Bad is ludicrous. I Didn't think it's absurd. we make this argument like a year ago? We haven't made this argument. We have, I definitely have. You have, Okay. So yes. I know that we have flirted with this. I did the thing that I know people love where, where I say, people are saying, right, and I don't commit. I have said that there are aspects of the show that are impressive or more impressive or more thoughtful or the way that they've understood their story and dug deeper, you know, all of that, the production design, the values, whatever. I've talked about that. But I've never officially, I don't think, said one thing and or now, another about it. Right, because you never committed to the issue. You can form a super PAC yes. going against the bots who have been saying better call Saul. <laughs> Look, I know which of us is the JD Vance of this podcast, okay? <laughs> and I'm not saying I think the I think our listeners know. Okay. Yeah. So wait, so you did say this. I think I did. I think I did. Okay. Explain yourself. Explain your take now and how it's held up so far. You're not done. We're going to revisit. Well, for one thing, I think that I found Jimmy's transformation into Saul mm -hmm. more complicated and compelling than Walt's transformation into Heisenberg. And I also find at this point in my life, it's sort of fascinating to watch this guy do all of this without any of the trappings of the nuclear family around him. Because of, I think ultimately there was still like this idea that Walt was trying to like set his family up for life, that he had this surrogate son in Jesse who he was at once trying to protect, protect and reject. Mm -hmm. And that some of those things, while I'd never seen them done quite that way, felt somewhat familiar. And I don't feel like I've ever really seen anything like Saul before. And the cover that it got from Breaking Bad and the fact that it did two years of highlighting and, you know, small claims court before it became a crime opera for a couple of seasons. And I think in those couple of seasons from sort of peak Nacho through Lalo, Gus and, and Mike, like I... I found that that had like the best of all worlds of the Breaking Bad extended universe. I think that personally, I don't think that these shows are separated enough to choose one or the other though. Yeah, I think that's safe. I mean, I, I think that there are moments, the Mike episode where he broke his boy in the first season, I think ultimately in, in retrospect now season four, which I believe was the Werner and the Super Lab season was the high point of the show and proof that when given wrote given room to run with a story worth telling, they can make anything as compelling as the greatest show, as the greatest shows of all time. Mm -hmm. um, but I just think it, it, it's almost unfair at this point. I mean, I know it's just kind of knee-jerk Twitter stuff, but it's unfair to what the show does well and the way that it does it well, which is a little bit more, often more quiet, uh, more focused, more reserved, more thoughtful, uh, more reflective it does a disservice to those things to say this is better than inarguably one of the four greatest shows of all time. I mean, you, are you taking, not you, but when you say that this is better, are you taking bad off Rushmore? You no, can't. No, no. And putting this on, I think they you're right They came out at different they're, times. They're they, they did different things, yeah. And, 
And and your point about Walt, I think, is a really smart one because the, one of the lies of the difficult men era of prestige TV, right, was that it was about watching white men behave terribly under the auspices of societally approved, um, for societally approved reasons. Doing it for my family. It's okay then, because I'm doing it for my family. I'm yeah. doing bad for the right reasons. I'm looking in the mirror and I'm saying I'm not a bad person because look at the structure of my life and what I represent right. in the world. Stripping all that away, and Jimmy's a screw up who sees an opportunity to not be a screw up, that is more compelling. But I'm finding it more and more like, you know, and this is, goes back to our music arguments that, well, you know, that, that, not that we have, but one people have, right? Which is just like, I don't know, I, I don't know why I'm thinking of Bowie. But when like Bowie's last album, Black Star, came out, and it's a masterpiece, it's brilliant. But it's not better than you know his '70s records. It's not, and it's silly to say that it is. It's good because he made those records, and then thirty plus years later, facing mortality, he still had the fire, right? And he had a different voice to use at that moment of his life. And that's how I think about the show. They are connected, but it's silly to be like one's better than the other, especially because. Think about how Breaking Bad ended. That's what I'm mostly hung up on. Like that was a show that was momentum, and the end. Those so you last thought like episodes, all the stuff with Todd and the white power guys and torturing Jesse and everything like that all all that shit was like perfect to you? <laughs> no, <laughs> that framing. No, but I just feel like well, anytime I, you can torture someone with white power guys. No, but like look. I, 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 I'm that's some of my favorite the, content, but like, I just think like we're fucking like, you, you know, pandemic aside, not that we're April, 2020 Saul put on like the best season of TV that we've gotten in a long time. Season yeah, five of really Saul is fucking amazing. Yeah, it's, it is good. It is amazing. I'm not, I'm not denying that. I'm just saying it's not the cumulative accomplishment that Breaking Bad was. I'm just saying season five of Breaking Bad was one of the most, Body leaving transcendental experiences of TV watching, even when it, the things didn't work. If you watch it again, you're like, really? Why is that gun in his trunk? It was pure adrenaline. And it was an experience, an unmatched experience, you know? And there was not, maybe there was too much white power gang in torturing of Jesse, but there was not the kind of throat clearing that was watching Lalo lift a manhole cover and put it down again to spy in a lab. We know he's ultimately. This entire show has been that, though. This entire show has been like bus tickets and this, and like, I'm going to make this Xerox and then I'm going to do this. But we know, we know a lot of what's going to happen. I want to be wrong so badly. They've been you know, putting post-it notes up for seven years. I mean, like it is the show it is. I, I completely understand what you're saying. And I, I think that there is, you know, we are just tortured by like the amount of stuff we've got on right now. And I think it's like sort of weird to be like, this great show is calling its own shot on its ending. And like, you know, now we've gotten three sort of, I mean, I, I, yeah, this season was this season like a Hall of Fame season? No, it was not. Like, did I, I think that there okay. were some episodes early on that were really f- strong. I thought this episode was really interesting because it made me think about the characters in a different way. I think that there is a really, really bold leap to be made, both maybe chronologically, but also creatively in this show left in the, in the chamber. I just don't know why they didn't choose to do any of it now. You know, and maybe we'll and and maybe we'll find out. This is the sort of argument that you can only make when you accept two things, right? Uh, uh, one, we are lucky to have the show and spend more time in the world. I'm not going to say this is a mistake because look at Odenkirk. I mean, he's phenomenal. Like this yeah. is good. I want to be very clear about that. It's off game is better than most people. It's so much, it, and and this careers. also, I think I've been through so many sports debates. Where you're like the fucking warriors are dead, R.I.P. Oh, and then yes. you're just like, oh, look at that, they're well, going to the finals. Why, that's the other point I wanted to make, which is, it's coming back in like five weeks. Yes, it's coming back in like it's coming back on July 11th. So this is barely a hiccup, and then we'll race to the finish line and we'll see. But it's been interesting to experience it this way, and I look forward to hearing at some point once all is said and done, the person. The people who wait for it to be on Netflix who will watch this all as one season and maybe they'll have a completely different experience. Do you you want to try and talk a little bit about Barry before we go, or should we save it until Thursday? I think we should just because it's great. Yes. And we have been we've been remiss. Just want to put you in my my headspace for this last scene, basically, of Barry. You know, that the last this the Sally, Sally Barry scene. I have not 
felt worse about how fucking hard I laughed at a, at a, like a scene than I have about that last scene of Barry, where Barry is essentially in this really, really compassionate, sweet way, offering to poison another person's brain to the point where they hang themselves because he's trying to do something nice for Sally after her show has been canceled. And he's like, okay, you know, like I I can do something here. You know, I can use my specific set of skills to help you here. And it is so fucking funny to be like, yeah, you know, I wouldn't do anything weird. I just take it, take her dog and replace it with another dog or, um, change out all the furniture so that it seems real small and she feels like a giant, you know, like all this stuff. And you're like, you could just poison, the brain will just destroy itself. He just, he, just, he read about it. He researched online a little yeah, bit. Yeah, look, a couple of subreddits that he's on. And I was laughing like so hard at Hater's Delivery and like the specific examples. And then Sally's reaction is so horrified and is just so viscerally like, gutturally like, get the fuck out of my life. I I immediately felt like, oh my God, like what's wrong with me? But I also think that's the whole point of the scene. And to me, it was the, this this was the best episode of Barry this season. I thought the shootout, the way the shootout is filmed where the guy's like, hey guys, <laughs> he's on this video call with Michael Ironside and like is sh- filming like the Bolivians killing all the, ch- uh, the, the Chechens and everything. It's like, it was so great. And, uh, yeah, like the, I, I'd kind of been like, Barry's still good. Barry's still good. It just hadn't really like leapt out at me and been like a real like highlight film episode. And this was that. I'm, I want to talk about this now because after being critical of Saul before they finished, it's important as a corrective to say this episode was a masterpiece. The show is incredible. My discomfort with the first episode was entirely my own. And... I got to own that because what I thought of after watching this episode, I, Chris, you know, look, it's no secret to you or the listeners of this podcast that I listen to a lot of Mark Maron's podcast, <laughs> not this one. But one of the things that I do like what he talks about, and he was talking about this with Michael Che that last week, and he talks about it constantly, is just like the work of being a stand-up comedian that is so compelling to other stand-up comedians and hard to communicate to And apparently you, because you listen to every podcast episode about, about it. I do. But the idea of that the job isn't, this is something Michael Che actually says that he didn't know because he was like watching Comic View and like Politically Incorrect. And he was like, this will be great. I'll just make a special and they'll film it. But that the actual job is you get on stage and you try stuff and some of the stuff works, some of the stuff doesn't. Some of it works, some of it doesn't. And eventually you get the calibration, you get right and you get the recipe right. And then you can pour the drink whenever, right? But you got to figure out that balance. And Bill Hader wasn't a stand-up comedian, right? I mean, he was an editor. Like the fact that he is a one of the great comedic performers of our time is hilarious and almost like an aberration. But there is something to that spirit in the show that I want to recognize and celebrate because its tonal balance ought to be impossible. There should not be a show that can have this much to say about abusive relationships on such a visceral level or trauma or how trauma is passed on. And streaming and networks. Also, and also have a joke about the 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 algorithm that determines whether shows are successful or not. Like it just, that's impossible. It's impossible. And to the show's credit, it is again, this is the feature, not the bug. Sometimes the calibration's a little off. And sometimes you laugh too hard and then you don't cry enough or whatever they're going for. And then, but the reason you do the work is for an episode like this, which was such a precise tightrope walk, right? <laughs> I mean, it was so dark. And it was so funny, and it was so sweet, and it was so I should so correct horrifying. myself. That's not actually how this episode ends. No. The episode ends with a mother shooting her son accidentally in the chest. Yes. Annabeth Gish. Yeah. Shout out the bridge. <laughs> and that's not the A story. That's the D story. You know what? Can I tell you something? You know what you should start doing? Just whenever we mention an actor, be like, was great on Briar Patch. Uh, I start doing but that? But just start doing that with like Denzel Washington. And it was so nice just, of him to do just, it, to, just a bit part in Briar Patch. Just to get those streaming numbies up on Amazon's freebie. Vin Diesel, a lot of people think he just drives cars. <laughs> Wonderful as a janitor on Briar Patch. The same episode as Albuquerque's Gene Efron, yeah. episode four, <laughs> streaming now on Amazon's freebie, formerly IMDb TV. Um, I, this is still the episode that also had, I mean, Anthony Kerrigan is always incredible as no ho Hank. 
But that entire run that he has with Cristobal, Michael Irby, too, the two of them are wonderful. They were They're so wonderful good together. together. Yeah. Their conversation about honesty and whatever, and then Anthony Kerrigan's eye roll about having to listen to more Percy Jackson audiobooks. I felt seen. Percy Jackson, <laughs> very big figure in my household at the moment as well. To his face in the closet, you know, which is which is thematically appropriate for that moment, that was absolutely devastating emotionally, right? And it's all there in this one show. Henry Winkler's performance in this episode, absolutely beautiful. Laura San Giacomo is in this episode. Shout out to her. Phenomenal. Mantegna has been great. Joe Mantegna <laughs> looks incredible. Can we just sidebar on that? Yeah. I don't know if he wore his own clothes to be on this show, because if that's what he, if that's just silver foxing it around LA, my God. Incredible. We should all be so lucky. Uh, I have to say that as soon as this episode, well, this episode really reflected an experience that I had had, which is, I don't know what, like, they could be lampooning Netflix or whatever, but the what's the network called? SheBan? What's the stream? Banshee. Banshee. Uh, Banshee. And she's like, we finally found it when we searched <laughs> Joplin, <laughs> Sally, like, all these things. That it, was my experience the other night when I opened up HBO Max and I couldn't find hacks. Yes. And I think I that that, that yes. was a reaction to how hard I slammed my laptop when hacks did the Sixers joke. Yeah. I knocked hacks off of the homepage. We will be discussing this further. Jen Statsky, you are on alert. That was an act of violence toward us and we've been nothing but nice to your show, which we love. Yeah, so I mean, um, I, I don't know if I have anything else but that like, this, this show's ability to like make you feel uncomfortable while also crack up is pretty special. And yeah, I'm, I, I'll be interested to see where they take the Barry Sally stuff going forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think that this show is doing everything we say we want, everything that we say we want shows to be doing. It is fearless and it is running straight at not just every potential plot issue, but every emotional one as well. And that was the thing that kind of started to reel me back in in the beginning of the season when I realized, oh, it's not just that they're confronting the fact that Barry is a assassin or a killer, which mm -hmm. which Gene now knows. It's that he is an abuser, you know, in ways that might not seem traditionally abusive, right, to, to a very sort of like, you know, caveman brain approach to how things are portrayed on television. And I thought that that was incredible. And they just keep pushing it. And they do the thing that the best shows do, which is you push through the thing that you're afraid of and you find another level after it, like where the Gene Barry relationship currently is or the journey that Gene is on because of Barry. You know, How did you feel it's, about... Um, it's awesome. I'm going to let you go, but I wanted to ask you one like little TV writing mechanics thing. Yeah, I'm going to go rewatch Friday Night Lights. This episode introduced... Well, these last two episodes have just introduced like half a dozen new characters. So both as sort of maybe passers-by like... Joe Mantegna, but Laura San Giacoma seems like she's going yeah. to be a recurring character. Annabeth Gish and her son obviously will now have a lot of drama placed on them. If we've we ever also, see them again. Right. We've also now had, you know, Miguel Sandoval played the head of the <laughs> Briefly. car cartel. He died. And then they brought in Elena, who's like the queen of the South kind of thing. They really like kind of, it's not like hat on a hat kind of stuff, but they are really like throwing a lot of also pitches. Also, the new FBI agent played by Barry's That's right. former That's uh, right. uh, colleague. Yeah, I, I just, I mean, I, I actually just got got recently uh, dragged for this in a in a writer's room that I I love new characters. Bring sure. them on. That's why we were able to find you know find roles for 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 Michael Sheen and Peter Capaldi. And, I thought that uh, that was Bremer really special. What, that, and uh, the, Viola the, Davis and the others episode of Briar, Briar Patch, Patch that was set in Wales was fantastic. Thank you, thank you. Not many people made it to episode nineteen, but as I said, whole series streaming on Freevee. I love it. I love it because you know if you can justify them, if they have a role to play, and I think it, the answer to it to me from a story perspective is baked into the way you asked the question, which was Miguel Sandoval was there for a minute, then he died. Mm -hmm. Like the show is relentless. It is an engine that moves only forward. I, want, so, I wonder what it means for the central core characters. Like, and how many times Hank can hide in the closet and what to do with well, Sally, I, you know? I, I think it's a great point. I mean, I, I think that not everyone 
is going to be on the show. Everyone on the show now is not going to be on the show in season four, which, you know, this is not a surprise, but was officially greenlit last yes. week and it, with with um, with Hader directing the entire season going full auteur. Yeah, I, I, I'm curious as well where, where that will go. But I mean, it's kind of it's kind of cool when you're like, oh, no, no, the things that felt off. No, they were right, and I was wrong. That's something that we should remember as uh, as podcasters. Doesn't make for the, you know, it's not the sexiest podcasting, but it's true. I feel like we've grown as podcasters and as people today. Thanks to Kaya McMullen for producing. Uh, Andy and I will be back on Thursday. Probably do some We Own the City, uh, best show on television, and best show on TV. Uh, I love it so much. Well, maybe you know, there's a couple of things. Uh, Obi Wan will be the next day. Stranger Things and Obi-Wan coming out both on Friday. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that stuff. We're going to talk for at least 75 minutes about the running lengths, the episode lengths of Stranger Things. Was that, that will be your contribution to the discourse? Yeah, I'm just going to talk for 80 minutes about episodes being too long. We did a good job today. Long one. Uh, we'll talk to you guys on Thursday. <laughs>